Does that make sense? Why would it be illegal to produce a car-free environment? Parking. Parking requirements, exactly. Are any of you in the architectural elective on the triple-decker? No? And so they, so they, uh, they formed a group and they said, this is crazy. We need to make it legal to produce the kinds of spaces we need to produce for clients like this one that uh, reduce the amount of automobile domination. Uh, and so they formed, and they were very critical of the International Congress of Modern Architecture, and they decided to do the exact opposite of them. And in the process, they did the exact same thing as the Congress for, for, of Siam. So they became the organization uh, known as the Congress for New Urbanism. Have you heard of the Congress for New Urbanism? OK. So the Congress for New Urbanism established using the, they, they they discovered the valley section and they said, we invented the valley section and they discovered Patrick Geddes and they claimed that they invented the transect idea. This is the transect idea where there are different scales of urbanism and on each scale it is possible to strike a proper balance between architecture and human scale uh, experience while controlling the domination of the automobile. Is it without parking? No, there is parking. There's parking along the street. Uh, there's parking behind the buildings. But there's always, and then there's structured parking when you get to higher densities. But ever and always, throughout each of these four densities, there is a very careful management of automobiles. The streets are kept narrow. The parking is kept uh, pushed into very controlled locations. <clears throat> then we get um, one of the members of the Congress of New Urbanism is Peter Calthorpe, who developed uh, an approach to developing higher densities within a quarter mile of uh, transit stations. So this is the diagram of transit-oriented development that is going to be a central part of every firms work in the coming century where higher densities and again the classroom provides us with a clear demonstration right there that building right there is the outcome of transit oriented development of northeastern multiplying the value of their land um, from 1 million to 10 million just by uh, taking advantage of this principle of transit-oriented development. Here's Peter Calthorpe. We don't have time for Peter Calthorpe. William H. White is an urbanist and is the mentor of a project for public spaces because of his seminar work and the study of human behavior in urban settings. Not an architect. For nearly two decades, White has been observing how people use streets and public spaces. Although City is about the design and management of urban spaces, White's true fascination is with the life and rituals of people out on the streets. For him, the street is a stage. So he uses uh, movies. In his article about the social life of the street, White talks about the different aspects that are related to how people move around the city specifically in New York, which is basically where he lives. Here he talks about street behavior, street conversations, and the like. In the first part of the article, White talks about street conversations. Here he shares an experiment that he did with his research team, which required them to focus time-lapse cameras on several street corners and recorded activity for two weeks. On maps of the corners, they plotted the location of each conversation and how long it lasted. 1980s. And to screen out people who were only waiting for the light to change, 
they noted only those conversations lasting a minute or longer. The results of the activity were not at all as expected. Even White didn't expect it, as it showed that people who stopped to talk did not move out of the pedestrian flow, and if they had been out of it, they'd moved into it. He observed that most of the conversations were smack in the middle of the pedestrian flow, which is also known as the 100% location. So the so this relates to Yang Gil's work. Children to, to bicycle from their five years, you can walk around with the kindergarten on the sidewalks in the parks and the squares and the pedestrian streets. And and thinking about it, you see many children in a city like Copenhagen. And that has led me to say that if you see a city with many children and many old people using the city, the public spaces, then it's a sign that there is a good quality for people in that particular city. So Copenhagen has been transformed over the past 50 years, in part because of the relationship between Jan Giel's university and the municipal authorities of the town. transforming parking lots into parks. What has actually happened is that um, the first they, they started to push out the traffic from various streets and squares in the medieval city. But later on, they moved out to other parts of the city. And in 2009, the city of Copenhagen City Council they formulate a new strategy. We will be the best city for people in the world. And emphasizing that all these good things for people should not be in the city center for the tourists and for the shoppers. It should be for everyone around the city. And we, some of the examples of this policy is maybe that when you have small streets going into big streets, you always take the sidewalk across the small street so that you can continue your walk or your wheelchair, whatever, uninterrupted. And the guys coming from the side street would have to go up on the sidewalk and go down again. Much cheaper than putting a and tunnel under the street. Was just a very good idea. But then I heard from my daughter that now my granddaughter, Laura, who at that point was seven years, because of this change in the way they conceived the crossings. Now Laura was able to walk all the way to school because she could stay on the sidewalk from her front door to the school door. And it's a very great difference when you are seven if you have to cross four streets or if you can stay on the sidewalk all the way. So that's a sign of a more humane policy and a more humane city and city quality for everyone. Shouldn't this and crosswalk be raised up front? Is that nearly all the streets were asphalt from one wall to the other, but now they are typically only two lanes, one lane each direction, a median where you can rest while going across the street, street trees, bicycle lanes, and sidewalks. And these streets, which are now nearly all the peripheral streets have been transformed this way, then it's much more beautiful, it's much more safe, much less accidents, it's much more people friendly, it's much easier to cross the street, and it can take almost the same number of cars as the old streets could, because the traffic engineers have been become much smarter than they were in the 70s and 80s. So, there's a lot of these transformations. Another big change in Copenhagen has been the fact that they decided early on, and especially after the oil crisis in the 70s, that the old tradition of using bicycles in Copenhagen should be promoted, should be celebrated, and everything should be done to invite people to drive, to, to bike more. And they have now put in all these enormous efforts to make it a really inviting city for bicycles. So, um, so the 
street section that was rejected uh, in the Athens Charter is now back and uh, with a vengeance uh, where it's been altered subtly to narrow the traffic lanes from 14 feet, which is the freeway standard, to 11 feet or 10 feet, which is the new standard in town. And when the lane is narrower, traffic tends to go more slowly. Uh, town after town has reduced the default speed limit. I don't know if you've run into this, uh, but this, the default speed limit in many towns is 45 degrees, on, uh, 45 miles per hour, unless otherwise posted. That has come down over the last few decades from 45 to 35. The city of Cambridge last year reduced the default speed limit down to 25 miles per hour, and they're in the process of moving it down to 20 miles per hour. So what happens when you reduce the speed limit in a town to 20 miles per hour? People get mad. <laughs> But does it interfere with the number of cars the city can handle? Yeah, it, does. it kind of slows everything down. And then especially like now that you're going 20 miles an hour, like it's a lot more, like essentially everything else is slower. Like people feel a lot more free to go back and forth across. To jaywalk. Yeah, so it right. slows things down some more. So now there's no point in even driving too much. Um, Returning the city back to pedestrians and kind of reducing the over induction by automobiles in the space. So, this is something I hope will continue on Wednesday. Um, the, well, the point of reducing speeds most, most of the time is to prevent an accident. If you're driving slower, then it appears in theory that it's possible to be doing an accident, which then, you know. So, yeah, um, to this point, in some contexts, reducing the speed limit of cars has exactly the impact that you expect. It means slower movement of cars, fewer cars per hour. But in many other contexts, like the city of Cambridge, the studies show that, I don't know, have you driven through the city of Cambridge in a car? It sucks, right? It's so congested. So I get a green light, and when the guy in front of me finally hears me honking, leaning on the horn and gets off his uh, text message, um, we both accelerate quickly to, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 miles an hour, and then, ah, oh, what happens? You're in another traffic light. You know, I should be going 50 miles an hour the whole time without any traffic light. It's almost as if, if we could slow down traffic, eliminate, because of the increased safety, eliminate the traffic lights, and just go 20 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour through the city, we would actually get there faster. Turns out that is true that when cities reduce the speed limit, and in the rare instance where it's enforced so that the traffic level, uh, the traffic speeds are lower, there's less of this, you know, step on the brakes, step on the gas, step on the brakes, step on the gas. There's less of that herky-jerky driving pattern and more of a flow that accommodates eye contact between multiple users. The actual uh, volume of traffic uh, can get back to exactly what it was before or actually increase. And at the same time, there's a principle called uh, uh, livable streets, which uh, next version of the lecture I'll have a slide on livable streets. Um, uh, it's an organization that is all over the country and all over the world. And one of their principles is uh, vision zero. So the vision zero is zero traffic fatalities uh, on the streets of the city. And so there are a lot of towns that are committed to that. And drive, the driving force behind this commitment are 
teams of architects and urban designers who are committed to the Vision Zero idea. Uh, and um, it's also uh, increases, it increases the quality of the spaces, especially for children and the elderly, and it helps uh, reduce obesity and heart disease. This has been a big problem. Uh, some people now claim that sitting is the new smoking, that friends don't let friends sit all day long. And so uh, a public health uh, policy push is to get people walking <laughs> as part of their routine, even if it means just parking a little bit further away than you would normally park. Instead of looking for celebrity parking at the front door, you park in the Parker Street lot at the farthest location. And you build in walking into your routine. And instead of sitting at the desk all day, you have standing desks. And instead of having meetings around a table, you have walking meetings. Um, and so all of these things are part of uh, this vision for moving forward in a healthier way, both on the level of individuals and society in general. If anyone has ideas for Wednesday that you want to talk with me about, I am available. Uh, thank you. I forgot about this one. I'll, be, I'll send this to uh, on your WhatsApp.